You're here because we determined last time how much a wall displaces under in-plane loading for a masonry shear wall. But we used our gross moment of inertia last time and we weren't quite sure is that what we should be doing as design engineers or in school or in proper analysis. Well, I did my homework and I have come to a conclusion and I'm ready to share it with all of you. Get in here, you're not gonna wanna miss it because we're going over everything. The information of the hour is our moment of inertia. Last time we found displacement using that number. But for uh, a practicing engineer in the building industry, uh, that is not the correct approach to use. Uh, I stuck with it last time because it's simple and it's straightforward and it, it got the point across of the, of the video, of the example, but it's not something I would suggest that you do in one of your designs. Um, and it, it's kind of funny. So I'm gonna break it up here like this. We're gonna talk for a hot second here. This video is not very numbers intensive. Number one, the TMS doesn't have any guidance or literature on what type of moment of inertia you should be using or your cross-sectional area that you should be using for the displacement of in-plane shear walls. They have plenty of criteria for out-of-plane analysis, but nothing for in-plane analysis. They stayed quiet on that, which was, which was interesting um, and it made it more complicated, right? I'm using masonry, so I should be following the masonry material code, and they don't have any information on this subject, well, where do I turn next? Uh, you can see here, as I'm blabbering, that I do have some information. Let's start with this. So the ASCE 41, I don't know why the seven is there. ASCE 41, this is uh, provisions from the ASCE that goes over uh, retrofit, seismic retrofits of existing structures. And they suggest your eye effective for in-plane uh, analysis should be taken as 0.5 I sub N. I sub N in this case is, is your gross moment of inertia. Your cross-sectional area, AVE, so your cross-sectional area for your shear stiffness, uh, E being effective, should just be equal to A and V. So A and V again in my variables is just AG is your gross cross-sectional area. Uh, so there's no change in that cross-section when running the analysis based on the suggestions or the, the mandates of the ASCE 41. Uh, I did say that the TMS uh, 402602, I should clarify that, didn't have any criteria, but allegedly the TMS strength design guide, so they have an additional manual that uh, is actually really, really helpful. I've, I've looked through it before, but never had a copy of my own. I don't have one currently. Uh, and it's basically has designs of everything masonry within it based on the TMS. That is really helpful for practicing engineers to make sure that they're applying the code to the actual, uh, their designs correctly. They suggest the following for in-plane displacement analysis. I know that can sound scary and long, but in-plane analysis is just when there's the load in plane with your wall and it's pushing on it and it's displacing it, it's moving it some amount. Just, I know we've done a couple of these videos here, but I just, when I spout off those long phrases, it can sound really scary. That's all that this is. They suggest that I sub E taken as one half your gross moment of inertia, but they also suggest that your uh, cross-sectional area should also be taken as half or 0.5. So an interesting take. Uh, one other thought that I had was, all right, well, the TMS, uh, before it was called the TMS was, and I don't know what, what it was like the, what it, exactly the title was, but was written by the ACI code. T uh, Masonry fell under the concrete code and the concrete committee. So prior to it being called the TMS, the Masonry Society and them forming this code and having that title, it used to be called like the ACI, like 530 or something like that. Don't quote me on that, but used to have the ACI title. So I said, all right, what does the ACI recommend? Concrete and masonry, while different, have plenty of similarities, we all know. So they they act and perform similar to one another with some, some caveat there. Well, in chapter six, you do have your beautiful table, very clear. Uh, moment of inertia for cross-sectional areas permitted for elastic analysis. 
at, at factor load level design. And you have all of your different conditions. So based on the element you're analyzing, well, for us today, we're doing walls. And look, they give two criteria, actually. They say, if, if you were designing your wall so that it doesn't crack, or if you're designing your wall so that it intentionally cracks under an extreme loading event, you, they tell you or mandate that you take, you run your analysis with a moment of inertia um, of these two. Um, and then they also say, and then your cross-sectional area, you can just keep it at 1.0 of your gross cross-sectional area. So no need to change that. You can go a little further though. We're not gonna stop here. This is what I did. And down here from my studies in concrete, I remembered this. You, you could, well, I guess before we skip it, you could go to table B and they go even more in depth about columns and walls and give you some additional uh, alternative values for I that you could use. Or you can go a step further and you can say, hey, you know, let's uh, 0 0.7 versus 0 0.35, let's split the difference and let's just say uh, you're permitted to use an I equal to 0 0.5 of your gross. Sound familiar? Yeah, it aligns with the uh, the other recommendations as well. That's enough soul searching for me and I approve of this method. I'm gonna use that and apply that to my in-plane analysis to determine uh, the, the new stiffness or, or the correct stiffness of this wall and then subsequently the correct displacement of this wall. That's kind of uh, the gist of it but you might be missing out on why we do this. Why do we do cracked? Why do we do gross? Why do we, why does it matter all that much? Well, simply put, if we are taking, uh, like we did in the last video, the gross moment of inertia, that will ultimately give us a much, much stiffer wall because we are utilizing the full extents of that wall, assuming it's totally rigid and doesn't crack and crumble or do you know get damaged in any way and so if it's undamaged and you get to use the full extents of it it is more stiff so subsequently that means your wall is going to displace even less we know that not to be the case in an extreme seismic event or design level event it could be wind it doesn't always have to be seismic we are under the understanding that that wall is just gonna be beat to all hell. It's just gonna get the crap kicked out of it. It's gonna crack, it's gonna crumble. There's gonna be damage. And it, that's going to happen during the design level event. And what does that do? When it cracks, when it crumbles, uh, it is getting less stiff. So your, your structure is getting less stiff. Your vertical lateral elements are getting less stiff, which means your structure is displacing more. So this structure is moving more and more as it gets beat up more and more. And if you have a job where you have a building and there's buildings surrounding it, you need to make sure that that displacement uh, is, is kept in check and you're designing your structure so that it doesn't move too far and start colliding with other structures adjacent to it. That's one problem that could happen. Another problem, even if you just had a, a building all by itself, is that if you didn't expect a your building to, to displace as much, well, as the building displaces, you are building up eccentricities, you know, as the load moves away from its, its neutral axis or its center of mass, you are creating eccentricities, which means you are bringing in second order effects and you're creating additional stresses within the structure that they weren't initially designed for. Um, and as you move further and further, as your building continues to move further and further, those stresses amplify and get worse and worse and worse. So if you run an analysis with gross uh, properties for everything, you are assuming, you are under the assumption that your, your building won't move as much, which means that most likely you'll end up designing your structure for, uh, for loads that are smaller than it may encounter. So that's not a good thing. Well, let's stop with the conversation and let's put some uh, some words to action here. Let's, let's get the numbers going. Let's do a little experiment. We have all of our, our steel built up at our ends uh, and that is going to be the thing. So steel right here and right here. 
that is helping counteract our lateral forces. Let's say that at those ends, because when, when your wall wants to move like this, you're gonna build up tensile forces in this direction if, if the force is coming from this direction, and compressive stresses at this end. Earthquakes and wind events never just move in one direction. You're going to get an action of forces moving from each direction. Uh, so you are going to get reversal in your loads. So this could be tension or compression. And this side of the wall can be tension or compression as well. When this happens, if I go blue, this kind of zone in here of the wall is going to get beat up more than the rest of the wall. So let's say that, for an example, we'll say, you know what? Under an extreme event, one foot of this wall on each of its ends just gets beat to all heck and is no longer effective to count on. Our cross-sectional area, we are permitted to just keep as 1.0. So this point that I'm making aside, we'll ignore that. If you'd like to and be a little more conservative, you could uh, do, you know, A effective, and that would turn into 216 inches minus a foot from each end, so 24 inches total, times the thickness to get you your cross-sectional area. And you could use that and plug that into your stiffness equation, and that will get you a, a lesser stiffness. You could do that if you wanted to. We take our moment of inertia about the center line of our wall, and so IE is gonna be equal to the same B, 7.625 inches, get my big fat head out of the way. Our depth now is now going to be 216 inches minus a foot from each end, so minus two feet. We're gonna cube that, all that over 12, and that spits out, still a very big number, but significantly smaller than what we got for our gross. And now if we want to compare them, I'll go in blue here. We'll do IE over IG. And if we plug both of those in, that equates to 0 0.7. And then if we bring IG back over here, we'll get that IE effective equals 0 0.7 IG. So just from a fun little analysis here, uh, we see how quickly our gross moment of inertia drops when we start to take chunks of our wall off of the ends. And we remember it's because the equation that we are using, if I circle it in black, is dominated by our D variable. And D is the length of your wall. So as you start to lose chunks of that wall, because it is to the third, any little bit that you decrease is it doesn't decrease the stiffness of your wall linearly. It, it hurts it exponentially. That calculation was run on an 18 foot long wall, not a, not a short wall by any means. Uh, so imagine, I mean, to get to the prescribed 0 0.5, there's really not much further assumption of, of lost uh, ends of your walls that we need to do. Maybe, maybe it's a foot and a half Maybe it's two feet from each end. That, that brings you all the way down to 50% of your gross moment of inertia. The reason I, I kind of wanted to look at that is, a, is to say, man, is the code really penalizing us this badly for no apparent reason? Like, it really needs to take 50% away? What's, you know, doesn't that seem to be a little harsh? Well, through that fun little experiment that took, what, two, three minutes? We determined, yeah, it it hurts pretty badly, but it's not the it's not the code being cautious. It's it's clear why uh, you get hit so badly. And so we remember from last time, this is our displacement equation. Uh, the first chunk of the equation is flexural deformation. The second part is shear deformation. But let's go ahead and switch out I gross with I effective. And in our case, I gross we can just divide by two to get 0 0.5 Ig. Uh, everything else remains the same. And then for our case, uh, A is also going to remain unchanged. We're gonna use 1.0 uh, AG to equal effective cross-sectional area. 
Something you may consider and talk about with your principals and your project managers is uh, actually something you can check based on this equation. Depending upon the, you know, the aspect ratio of the type of shear wall that you're analyzing. Is it super tall and super narrow or is it super long and super stout? Uh, will, you know, we remember that we can determine, well, is it is it flexural deformation driven or is it shear deformation driven? And depending on those, uh, you may teeter more so in the assumptions that you make for modifying your stiffness. If it's a very tall, slender wall where flexural is a major, major contributor to the overall displacement, you may go back to the ACI and say, you know what? They said it was between 0.35 and 0.7, but they permit you to use 0.5. Um, we have an extra tall wall that's super flexible. So we're actually gonna use 0.35 and then vice versa. If your wall is super chunky, long and short, you're gonna say uh, all, almost all of this displacement is driven from shear deformation. So, you know, I know it says, hey, you can just take 1.0 AG to equal AE, but maybe now all of a sudden the provision from the TMS strength guide is kind of looking a little more favorable for you. And you're like, you know, I actually want to err on the side of caution and assume that our building is going to, uh, our short shear walls are gonna be impacted during that, that loading event. And uh, I want to reduce our, our shear stiffness to make sure I'm properly capturing the amount of displacement of my structure. So instead I'm gonna use 0 0.5 AG for our number two variable. Hopefully that makes sense. I know I'm getting a little off the, the rails here and not being too straightforward. The number one takeaway on that is to, is to go back to my other videos and take a look at when we talked about the differences of flexural and shear deformation and, and how that, that will sway your, the conversation and how you want to ultimately analyze this. From last time, shear contribution is 0 0.01 inches. I spaced out and didn't put the cubed right there. And our flexural deformation equals 0 0.0189 inches. Those combined together to get your total displacement equals 0 0.0289 inches. In comparison to last time, we had 0 0.0196 inches. So what is that comparison? If we do uh, 0 0.0289 over 0 0.0196, get my fat head out of the way, that equals 1.474. So that is a 47% increase in displacement of our wall. If you're still curious, I want to know more things about structural engineering, I suggest heading over to my channel and checking out a couple other videos, you know? check it out. Or maybe the one up here or over here, whatever YouTube is suggesting for you. Subscribe if you haven't already, but you don't have to, you know the spiel. And uh, I guess really, if you wanna go one step freaking further and you wanna get that auditorium seat reserved, consider becoming a member, part of the Peruka gang and unite more structural civil engineers around the world to better ourselves, better our engineering industry community and just, yeah, be advocates for one another. Uh, this is Rich with Team Kesteva, and I'll catch everybody next time. Peace.